Okay. Well, um, welcome everyone to the second uh, webinar this year for our 2022 uh, wine marketing webinar series. Um, I'm Nicole Eilers with the Iowa Wine Growers Association, and uh, thank you so much for jumping on your or oh, jumping on this webinar over your lunch hour with us today. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on distribution, and I think this one is going to be um, really interesting and exciting for uh, wineries and, and just such a key topic, um, especially since wineries in Iowa do self-distribute. So like we were talking about Dorothy, um, wineries, you know, the, the staff at wineries owners, they wear many, many hats. Um, and so that's just one of the things that falls on the list. Um, here to talk about distribution today is um, Suzanne Henriksen and Evan Rothrock. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. yep. From the Crafty Cask, which is a media and marketing consulting company that works exclusively with craft alcohol producers to create, refine, and tell their story in order to grow their brands and the categories they play in. Um, Suzanne has 12 years of experience in consumer insights, marketing, and customer service. Um, and this broad marketing expertise enables her to develop effective marketing strategies and tactics along the entire customer journey. Um, and Ev Evan has spent 10 years uh, bringing craft alcohol enthusiasts to wineries, distilleries, cider houses, and breweries on tours with Max Napa Tours. Um, as a certified sommelier and cider professional, he has deep knowledge that he's passionate about sharing in a way that is engaging, approachable, and fun. Um, and prior to his work in wine country, Evan worked in the restaurant and bar industry, developing deep knowledge of all things service, sales, and alcohol. So um, we're really excited to have Suzanne and Evan with us today. And as a reminder, this is part of our uh, 2022 wine marketing webinar series, which runs through the end of the year and is sponsored by the Iowa Wine and Beer. And if you um, are interested in these types of webinars, our next one coming up will be Tuesday, July 19th, and we'll cover marketing specifically to Gen Z and millennials. So with that, I'll turn it over to Suzanne and Evan. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that uh, marketing to the younger generation. Yeah, it's that's I know. critical for wines these it days. It is critical for wines these days. All right. Um, so Nicole just did a great job introducing us. Thanks, I did want to take a second to um, give you a little bit of information about us. So as she said, the crafty cask, um, you know, we're all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers just like you. So that is why I founded this company was, you know, traveling for years and years, talking to craft makers as we tend to do. That's how we travel. We go and explore the food and the drink of the local area. And we just kept hearing time and time again that they were so passionate about what they did, but they were really having a hard time with some of the marketing and sales kind of components of it. And given that marketing is my expertise, and Evan has lots of years in the industry and has expertise there as well, we decided to kind of jump in and help. Um, and so some of the ways that we do that is through um, education like this. So we have a whole 10 course craft alcohol marketing bootcamp that really teaches people to go from kind of soup to nuts, from building your brand story, identifying who your target consumer is, all the way down to specific tactics like distribution, building your website, social media, all of that fun stuff. Um, and then we also have a free private community for craft makers to talk all about marketing. So that's the space where we are talking to a lot of our students who are in the boot camp and encouraging them and helping them learn. But it's also a space for craft makers to just ask questions of each other and kind of say, hey, we just are working on this ad right now. Do you, what do you guys think? Can you take a look at this? What do you, you know, and really get some real time advice from us as experts, but then also from each other, because you all have a wealth of knowledge yourself and have all experienced things, you know, throughout. <clears throat> um, the uh, next, I guess, yeah. hour or so that we'll be talking with you. Um, first off, thanks for being here. Uh, we'd like to thank Iowa Wine Growers Association for hosting us today. Uh, this webinar, we want to make sure that you're aware of two upcoming webinars as well that we'll be hosting in September and November. Uh, the first one is all about making the best of social media, organic social media. And the second is focused on driving tasting room traffic and conversions. Uh, so we hope to see you there. Um, today we'll be focusing on four areas and those areas with regard to distribution are the state of distribution today, uh, distribution myth busting, some tips and tricks to secure new accounts and trade marketing tactics to drive results. Uh, at any time, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, I think we've got a pretty small group today. So in fact, if there's a pause and you want to just jump in and ask your question, feel free to unmute yourself and do so. Um, and 
if we see them in the chat and uh, we see them, I guess, at an appropriate time, we can jump in and answer them right away, or we'll circle back to them uh, at the end of the, of the webinar. Yeah, so if we don't answer your chat questions right away, we saw it, don't worry, we will answer it. Um, but yeah, feel free to throw them in as you think of them so you don't forget them. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so while we know most of you are in Iowa and self-distributing, um, I want to take a minute to make sure you're aware of the distribution landscape today, and in fact, how fortunate you are to have the ability to self-distribute. This also is important for any of you who are considering working with a distributor directly. <clears throat> so first off, with, with regard to understanding distribution, there's a shift in the sheer volume of wineries and distributors. Uh, unfortunately, in the opposite directions. As recently as the 1990s, there were less than 3,000 wineries in the US and over 3,000 distributors. That's right, nearly a one-to-one -one ratio, which means wineries were getting a good amount of attention from their distributors. Furthermore, at that time, most craft wineries had a highly focused portfolio, usually not much more than five to six wines, primarily from grapes that were grown in their region. Fast forward to today, and there are more than 9,000 wineries, yet fewer than 1,000 distributors. So that favorable one-to-one -one ratio has dropped to nine wineries for every one distributor. And winery portfolios have gotten more complex with many winemakers now bringing in grapes from other regions or focusing on single vineyard expressions to expand their portfolio. In addition to that, the craft beer and craft spirits industries have also exploded in the last 30 years. And with many distributors covering multiple categories of alcohol, that means even more makers are vying for their attention. <clears throat> so what does that mean for you? Distributors are often spread way too thin, which means they often make promises that they can't deliver on, especially if marketing isn't their core expertise, which for many distributors, it simply isn't. Keep in mind that distributors are highly incentivized by big brands with big budgets and big margins. So as a small craft anchor, it can be even harder to get their attention. Long story short, working with a distributor is not a be all end all to increasing your sales. In fact, we would say you're at an advantage focusing on self-distribution since in today's reality, even if you work with a distributor, you as the winery are primarily responsible for most activities to actually turn that distribution into sales as shown in this table. So by owning the whole process, you are much more likely to succeed. Distribution is just the first step, selling to the right accounts, creating a marketing push and pull for your brand and developing relationships is the key to success, which is what we're gonna focus on today. As we get into specific tactics on how to make the most of your distribution, we're gonna frame them up in the context of these five common myths that hold marketers back when it comes to distribution, sales and marketing. As JFK said, for the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. As we bust each myth and talk about the reality, we'll also touch on some of the trade marketing tactics to employ to ensure that you're living the reality and bringing it to life for your brand. Common tactics used to drive sales at on and off premise locations generally fall into one of four categories, designated based on the time, effort, and cost required to implement these strategies as well as the impact they are likely to have on sales. First, the sweet spot, which is ideally where you'd like the majority of your activity to be because it's lower effort and higher impact. Next, going counterclockwise, we have a needle in the needle in a haystack. <clears throat> Those activities that indeed do require more effort but are worth it because they have higher potential for driving sales. Then there's the danger zone, which is the area that you wanna really be careful about and be selective in since they are high effort for lower impact. Lastly, we have the comfort zone. This one is tempting because it's low effort and includes activities that we're often more familiar with and feel easier for us to take on. But it's risky because the impact is low here as well. So this is the area that can trick you into thinking you're doing good work because you can check those items off the list as we all like to do, but then leads to frustration and disappointment with results. Here are some common trade focused marketing tactics and where they fall on this chart. I'm sure all of those things on the left hand side of the chart are pretty familiar and possibly even cover most of what you're doing today. But we're not here to be comfortable. 
We're here to push ourselves, learn how to day, use today's modern tools, and be more efficient and effective driving sales through the accounts we have or want placement in. As we walk through the distribution myths and realities, we'll be focusing on these five specific trade marketing tactics. <clears throat> Let's pause for a second. Any questions, any thoughts, anyone wanna kind of jump in at all? We'll try to pause occasionally. We're really good at just like keeping talking, talking, talking. We ask questions and then immediately start talking again after like a second. <laughs> like, we, like we probably just did. So I wanted to sort of speak from experience about the unique challenge of being a winery and introducing myself to a store or a new potential retailer as a distributor. Um, they kind of don't know what we do. You know, I have to keep saying I, I, I'm a distributor so that they direct me to the right person in that store that has the authority to bring me in and add our UPC codes to the store. Um, getting over that education of who we are and what we can do it is it can be challenging. You know, we're kind of outside of their box of understanding how the three tier system works, you know, so um, I just wanted to say that it's a special challenge that I think we face. Yeah, that's valuable insight because, you know, it is, I feel like a relatively unique situation that um, you get to enjoy the benefits of, but certainly there's a challenge in creating recognition and understanding. Um, so I guess a question to follow up would be, when you do approach a store or a restaurant, um, do you generally tend to ask to speak to their, their buyer or um, you know, who, who do you ask to talk to? Yeah, it, it definitely. Oh, you just muted yourself by mistake there, I think. Sorry, um, it definitely depends on who the retailer is. So um, if I'm going into a new grocery store, um, I ask to speak to the store manager, typically start there, and then he may refer me to um, a grocery manager, depending on the size of the store. Mm -hmm. sure. um, I also have experience getting our wines into Target and Walmart, which is a whole nother, um, you know, sure. level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, um, and, and that is so, and, and I've been having a lot of difficulty building relationships with people in Bentonville and in Minneapolis, where um, th those are where the people who punch in our UPC codes so we can actually sell wine at their stores uh, are located. And I've been very uh, challenged with developing relationships with those people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I think, you know, I, I worked at Clorox for 12 plus years. And so working with Target and Walmart was a big part of kind of what we did. And honestly, even as a huge company, it's challenging. So take a little bit of it. That doesn't help you, but take a little solace in like, they are very protective of the people in their headquarters and who yeah. they get to talk to and what they get to do. And so, you know, that is something that is a challenge across the board. I also would mention, you know, I think it's common sometimes for when we first introduce ourselves, we introduce ourselves in the way that we are most proud of that, you know, and so it's probably common to introduce yourself as a winemaker or as a winery. And I think just like leaving that out at first and really just like putting your distrib distributor hat on and just introducing yourself as like, I'm a distributor with this representing this winery. And then, you know, you can get into the nuance after, but it, it cause it does confuse people. It is confusing. And especially Liz, if you're talking about these national accounts that aren't just based in Iowa, I would imagine the Iowa based accounts understand this a little bit more because this is where they are. Um, but with the national accounts, it's super confusing and their number one yeah. priority is making sure they are legally compliant. So it probably just makes them nervous even talking to you directly as a winemaker or representative of the winery and not a distributor in their eyes. Yes, it's an education process. Yeah, yes. for sure. Thank you for sharing. So first up, the myth uh, that you need high accounts sold to be successful. You hear other wineries bragging about how many accounts they've sold. Feel envious? Think this is a clear indicator of success? Think again. Let's talk a little here about wide and thin distribution versus deep and thick distribution. Okay, so let's understand the difference between these two distribution strategies. Wide and thin distribution strategy, this suggests that the more accounts are better, even if they're subpar accounts. Positives, risk is spread over many accounts, right? That feels great. The negative though, is that many more accounts to pay attention to, to call on 
and to help drive sales to meet minimums. And then you're kind of hoping that the more successful accounts can carry the underperforming ones. The deep and thick distribution strategy, however, uses the 80-20 rule to focus your precious resources on a smaller number of curated accounts that really match your target market. So the positive when you're taking this approach is that these accounts work harder for your brand, saving you effort and increasing your potential. The negative here is that all of your eggs are in fewer baskets, which does make it riskier if not done correctly. And a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today will kind of help you think about how to do this correctly. <clears throat> to dive in a little bit more on this deep and thick distribution strategy, you wanna spend 80% of your effort selecting and building the 20% of your, of your accounts that really have the potential to matter. And to be even more effective with your limited resources, don't spend any time cultivating relationships with the bottom 30% of your accounts. As the middle 50 and top 20 grow with your passion and your influence, the bottom 30% will either get the clue and grow of their own accord and begin to talk about your brand and your products or miss out on your success entirely. Be okay with the natural streamlining because remember, it's not about the number of accounts, it's about the quality of accounts. So now that we have you focused on the top 20% of your existing accounts, how do you find new high potential accounts? Maybe even ones that would be a better fit than your existing top 20%. We're gonna walk through these five key identifiers to assess new accounts against. <clears throat> so first there's customer traffic. Just like you would like to think about this when opening up your own tasting room, the more foot traffic or potential for new customer visits, um, your account has the better it is for your brand. This is especially true of on-premise locations who can help drive trial for your brand with by the glass sales. <clears throat> and on-premise is something we're gonna talk quite a bit about today because we do feel like, and we'll talk about this later, a lot of winemakers kind of focus on off-premise and on-premise has a lot of potential there. Um, and some of the things that are listed on this slide kind of give you some indicators of, you know, restaurants and bars with more foot traffic if they have outdoor space, um, hotels even, right? So only about 40% of a hotel bar and product offering are like mandated by corporate, whereas the other percentage are kind of up for grabs and getting your product in front of tourists is a great idea. And that obviously exists in retail locations as well as Liz just mentioned um, with respect to getting the placement of a local product in Target mm -hmm. or in Walmart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just want to say it's not easy. <laughs> of course. I, think, I think it took me two years to get into the Walmart and Davenport, um, and it took me a year to get into the Target. So it's, yeah, it, it's constant. Go back in and visit them. Do I have the right name at corporate? Getting them to bug corporate. Yeah, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, it's definitely not easy. Luckily, we're seeing more and more nowadays, um, bigger retailers focusing on local and focusing on craft, which is great. It at least gives some dedicated shelf space to some of those things. Um, Trader Joe's is a great example. They often in most of their stores nowadays have a whole set that's like local craft beer, or local wine. Um, but you're right, it's not easy. And to be clear, as we're talking through all of this stuff, if we're making it sound easy, we know it's not easy. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're just, we're trying to simplify it all for you guys, but we know that it's hard to put this stuff into practice. All right, next up, um, how likely is your target consumer to visit this account? If you don't know your target consumer deeply yet, then it's time to do that work. What we have on the slide here is the target consumer persona template that we use in our consumer centric marketing course in our craft alcohol marketing bootcamp. If you're looking at it, and feeling like you have no idea how you'd fill this out about your target consumer, I'm sorry to say, but you have some work to do. Because without this insight, you will always have a high proportion of waste in any marketing you do, including your distribution efforts. This is a common, common myth that a lot of craft makers and small business owners have, where they just think, I wanna get my name and my brand out to everyone and anyone who drinks wine in this instance. There is so much waste in that strategy instead of figuring out who are the people who really would resonate with your brand and your wine and focusing your effort on them and then trusting that some of those other people, that halo will work for you. So similar to our deep and thick strategy for distribution, you wanna focus 80% of your resources and efforts marketing specifically to your ideal target consumer. So once you know your target consumer well, you have to think about them when choosing accounts. Are your, is your target consumer high-end and hip? Are they low-key and casual? Are they family-oriented? 
Are they single and dating? Focus on accounts accordingly. <clears throat> now that you're focused on the fit for your target consumer, it's similarly important to focus on the accounts fit for your brand. And this is where it's imperative that you have a deep understanding of your own brand story. What makes you unique and stand out from other Iowa wineries? Um, and you know, it's not solely about your wine. That's a big part of brand story differentiation. It's about you and how your winery came to be, what drives you, what inspires you. Uh, we'll also inspire others and help to form lasting partnerships if you find the right accounts. So keep in mind, you're looking for win-wins, not something that's a force fit or anybody that will just say yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I forgot to, sorry, everyone. I forgot to change my slide here. We, we're just, we know our, we know our, <laughs> our presentation so well, we're just talking forward. So yeah, that's the kind of the recap of what I was just describing there, the, the fit for your brand, as well as knowing your target consumer. Um, yeah, a couple of helpful points there under the second bullet. Um, yeah, what well, we were just talking about the local beer or spirits, or mm -hmm. like if they if they're focusing on local beer and spirits, but they're not doing that on wine yet, they're probably interested in maybe doing that, right? right? So thinking about things like that. All right, so now it's time to shift gears and put yourself in the account shoes. Um, just like it's important to understand your own brand and consumer, it's important to truly understand your accounts. So before you even decide if you want to approach that account, do some research. Try to identify their wins, their challenges, the opportunities they may have, and understand their brand story and their target consumer. Lastly, think about your ability to build real relationships with this account. This is a time-consuming tactic, but so worth it. If they care about you and you make it clear that you care about them and their success, the rewards will be significant in both directions. People care about people. They don't really care about products as long as the quality is there. So as long as the wine is good, it's the people and the stories and the relationships that you convey and bring forth that will set you apart and lead to your success. Do you like the people that work at this account? Can you imagine hanging out with them, getting to know them better? If so, it's likely a good fit. So the example shown here is from someone I consider awesome at this strategy. She knows everyone at all of her local accounts personally, regularly visits their spots as a guest, not just when on a sales call, and regularly hosts trade appreciation events to get to know them better and showcase new products in a fun way that they enjoy. This quote here says it all. I think the most important thing is to just be genuine. They get hit up by 10 different people trying to sell them something every hour. So genuinely getting to know them, caring about them, learning what they care about, and asking how they're doing. This summer, I threw a party for all of my trade contacts I have developed relationships with. We had a volleyball pool party and it was epic. And I know for a fact that she was mixing up cocktails with her sip song spirits and getting everyone to try some of her fun cocktail creations as well. So again, time consuming, but the foundation of any success in business is relationships. Um, let's pause again, just here for a, a minute or two, if anybody has any comments or questions before we move on to our next myth. Yep. One other tip for my other winery friends. Um, I like to say I, that I shop there. So for both Walmart and Target, for example, I, um, I do my personal shopping there and I really do try to run into the person who brought us in the store so she can see me with my full shopping cart. Yeah, so absolutely. I, I weave that into conversations. Yeah. yeah, and continuing to do that, not just yourself, but your friends, letting them know, hey, uh, I know you like my wine. You're a friend of mine. It's being carried at this bottle shop. Go in there, please. Let them know that you know me and you appreciate my brand and ask for it specifically because that's something that the buyer that decided to make a placement yeah. of your product is going to love to hear. They, it makes them understand that they made the right decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Myth number two. Focusing heavily on trade product knowledge. The belief underlying this myth is that spending a ton of energy educating trade will lead to a big payoff in sales. Of course, anyone representing your brand should know the basics of your product, but that is only half of the puzzle for a few reasons. One, think about how much time a bartender or waiter or clerk at a store has time to talk to you as a guest. 
Do they often proactively suggest brands or products? And even when you ask, how does it go? Especially during you know, busy peak hours when most customers are out and they're running around crazy. Uh, and then second, while product details and quality are very important, consumers connect with and remember stories and people. So if you're primarily focusing on educating trade on your products, you're missing out on the most important elements for consumers and not giving trade that information that would be most helpful in selling on your behalf when they do remember, have time, or get asked. Think about heart versus head. It's kind of a, like, am I speaking from my heart right now or am I speaking from my head and giving stats and information? Reality number two to counter this myth is that push and pull marketing are the key to success. So focusing primarily on educating trade while important is a push marketing strategy. Equal energy should be applied to a pull marketing strategy, meaning consumers are asking for your brand product or at least are asking for craft or local wine. That's part of your job too, is to get consumers to care about craft and local wine and stop buying big booze everywhere they go, right? Um, and so thinking about these things and driving awareness and sales through consumers directly show, shows your accounts that consumers want products like yours, like Evan was just saying, right? If you have people who are going in and asking for your brand or asking for a local Iowa wine, that is great for you. And it demonstrates that you're working to drive sales for them versus solely relying on them. <clears throat> so educate trade about craft in general, wine in general, and your brand. Remember, people remember stories and people. It's human nature. So put some of your resources into telling the story of craft, what it really means to you, why drinking local is important, and what makes your brand unique. Bring it to life visually with captivating anecdotes and stories. Uh, help consumers and the trade understand the value without selling them anything. And kind of romance them. Uh, give them sound bites that are easy to remember, tools and tips and Help them make sense of labels and what's out there today. Um, you know, in my years before doing wine tours, I was a small A in a restaurant um, and getting wrapped up and learning about wine. I'd find myself standing next to a table, talking to them till I was blue in the face about the flavor profile of this Pinot Noir and its acid structure and how it would pair really well with this duck dish that we have. And they didn't care. It wasn't until I told them a fun quip about the name of the winery or the name of the vineyard site that the grapes were sourced from that they began to connect with the wine. And as soon as I learned that my wine sales tripled and it was really a powerful thing for me to understand. And it really demonstrates, I think, how important that concept is that you need people to connect with who you are and who your brand is and what you represent uh, to make lasting sales and to build loyal, you know, loyal customers. And to be clear, we are not saying the product details don't matter. Of course right? not. Like we are not saying that. We are not saying quality doesn't matter. Those are very important. But start with the stories. Start with the people. Start with the, and then you get them to taste your wine. And then they start asking like, oh, interesting. Is this is higher alcohol than I thought maybe it was? Is this higher alcohol? Or like, is this aged a new French oak? Or, right? Like then they start asking questions about the product. Yeah. A quality product is not a right to win. It's basically the barrier to entry. Yeah. All right, myth number three, it's all about the product and quality like we just were talking about. Um, so the belief underlying this myth is that if you have an amazing product, that's all you really need to succeed, right? It's that if we build it, they will come kind of thinking. In today's world, however, it's important to remember that when you're talking to consumers or trade, that a well-made wine is the cost of entry, not the right to win, as we just said. So um, plenty of brands, even from renowned regions like Napa, that fail despite making high quality wine. So if your social media feed, for example, is full of bottle shots and details about your wine, it's time to start shifting your thinking and telling more of your story to consumers, showing your more personal side, yourself as the winemaker getting in front of the camera, right? And I know we don't all love that, but it really does help. Yeah. So yeah, the reality is focus on your brand key differentiators not the products. People connect with stories and people, as we've said, not scores, gold medals, percentage of new French oak. So in order to develop loyalty, people need to know and care more about what's simply in the bottle. Why did you decide to make wine? When did you decide to start a winery? 
uh, you know, what is it about your wine business journey or your personal wine experiences in your life that's distinct from other wineries and other winemakers? Um, on the screen here now is uh, similar to the target consumer template. Um, if you're looking at this brand story template uh, and have no idea how to fill it out, time to spend some time and do a little deep dive on your brand story and how to bring it to life best. And Travis, for you, um, since you told us you're kind of early in the stages of getting started here, this is the kind of stuff that as you're learning, as you're building your brand, consumers love to see that journey. They love to see the behind the scenes of even like that you're attending a webinar today to learn about this thing, that you're tasting some wines to figure out what you want your wine profile to be like, right? That is awesome content to be using in advance to help build your brand, get people curious about you before you even have a product to sell. Yeah, you know, they often say that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is today. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's bring this to life with a little bit of a personal example here, a spirits one in this case. Um, so a few years ago, Evan and I were at a bar in San Francisco, um, sitting at the bar, chatting with a bartender, as we often do. Um, and since it was a slow evening, we asked him if there were any new craft spirits that we maybe haven't tried or that he was excited about. Um, and he immediately brought out a couple of bottles from Leopold Brothers in Colorado and started to enthusiastically tell us their story. He went on and on about how they have a molten floor at their distillery and rattled off some unique products they made in addition to kind of a standard spirit lineup. His excitement about this brand was palpable and his excitement about the people who worked there shone through. So it likely comes as no surprise that about a year later when we were in Denver for a conference, we remembered these stories because these are the things that people remember. They remember stories. There's a reason we all love to watch movies. We love to read books, right? Storytelling is like one of the earliest ways of communication. So we remembered these stories and made sure to plan a visit ourselves. We had a great time at Leopold Brothers Distillery getting to know the brand and tour their facilities. And lo and behold, we came home with a few bottles to add to our home bar. This is the magic of brand storytelling, especially at on-premise accounts in action. But it is a long game right? Like this was a year in the making of us getting bottles to our home. And that's why it's so important to be doing this stuff constantly and early. All right. So uh, myth number four, traditional sales calls and lots of them are required. The belief underlying this myth is that you need to be constantly pitching and calling on accounts. Sure. For important accounts, it is critical. If you're following our 80-20 rule, then you have fewer accounts to call on, making regular sales calls a little bit more feasible. But in today's market, there are even better ways to approach account acquisition and ongoing support that can lead to better results for less effort. So the reality to counter this myth is that you have to use technology and modern marketing to your advantage. Marketing activities and campaigns should also be created with a focus on reaching trade members. Remember, they are people just like consumers. And this is something that we find time and time again, distribution has such like deep roots in our country because of the three tier system, because of all of this, that so many people are just thinking about this the way it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, because it is so deeply ingrained in our industry. Yeah. Um, and so if you can be one of those makers that breaks out and really starts to use modern marketing, modern technology in order to help your distribution efforts. Things like lead generation, Facebook advertising, landing pages, email marketing, trade events. If you're doing those things, you are immediately putting yourself a step above of, I would say 80% of the people in the industry. Yeah. So let's talk here for just a little bit about Facebook lead generation ads. What are they? So they look like regular ads, but upon clicking through, the user sees a form that's often partially filled out with info that they previously shared on Facebook. Additional requested info can be inputted into the form at, or can be submitted as is. And this indicates the user's interest in whatever it is you're offering in that ad. In doing so, they are opting in to receive information on what you're promoting, be it a download, event information, sales sheets, uh, a portfolio tasting, um, a vineyard visit. So for these ads, it's important you offer some, them something in, of value in exchange for them providing you with their information. I know, <laughs> really? Advertising to trade? Yes. 
So using lead ads, you don't have to personally call on every potential wine bar, restaurant, bottle shop, right? Remember, the staff at your target accounts are people too. Marketing to them works just like marketing with consumers when done right. They're on Facebook, they're on Instagram, they are subscribers to mailing lists. So this approach fosters awareness and interest in your brand in a more efficient and less intrusive way. It gets you away from kind of cold calling, right? It gets you away from like calling them up and being like, can I come in and showcase you my portfolio and build a relationship with them in the way that they build relationships with other brands in every other part of their life. It also allows you to vet potential accounts before spending time on relationship building in person, which saves you time and energy. And so as a result, you're more likely to reach the right people with less time and fewer resources. <clears throat> now that you know what lead ads are and how they work, how do you go actually about actually identifying your target trade audience? This is critical and using the targeting tools available with Facebook advertising allows you to target effectively. These are three smart ways to target with lead ads on Facebook. First is the basic core audiences using Facebook's plethora of information that they have on everyone um, to find targets that are exactly who you want. For trade, think about demographics like job titles, such as a bar manager or a restaurant owner, uh, a bottle shop owner, um, even businesses, uh, I'm sorry, even behaviors like being a Facebook business page admin. Um, next, there are custom audiences. These take existing customer lists that you already have. Think of things like your mailing list, your wine club members, uh, tasting room visitors, um, or in the instance of trade, existing trade account contacts, mm -hmm. um, and essentially finding them on Facebook. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would you need to advertise to people that you already have in your database and already are aware of your brand? Well, one reason is to bring us to our third marketing approach, uh, I'm sorry, third targeting approach, which is incredibly powerful and often underutilized lookalike audiences. Essentially, this allows you to take existing audience who you already have and in your database mm -hmm. that respond well to your messaging and your brand and expand your audience by finding lookalikes or people that have similar demographics, interests, and behaviors to target. Let's pause here for a minute because there's a lot of information and it's a little technical and things that some people may not be doing. Any questions, concerns, thoughts on this here? Okay. All right, so once you have your lead ads running, it's important to have an email marketing plan for leads and accounts in place. A good CRM system lets you keep track of accounts and contacts within each account to see where they are on your lead funnel and ensure you're nurturing them, continue them on to the next phase. Meaning you can update their status, input information about their preferences, track meeting notes um, and outcomes, interests, and even personal details so that you can talk to them in a more relevant and personal fashion both through email, but also when you talk to them in person. And it's imperative that you have the ability to run drip email campaigns with your CRM, meaning automated emails triggered by specific actions or timing that you set in advance. Otherwise, you're constantly having to create and send unique emails one by one when you get new leads and no one's got time for that. <laughs> so this combination of lead ads and email marketing is incredibly powerful. It moves you away from the old school account management approach of Rolodexes and spreadsheets and lets you keep track of and engage with accounts in a personalized way and in an automated fashion. So I'm gonna spend just a little time talking about on-premise accounts. 80% of all wine sold on-premise is sold by the glass. And this is a remarkable thing because of its low cost point of entry. Um, there's a lot of common complaints among distributors and I would imagine among wineries that self-distribute with regard to the sticking of your product, um, how much time it takes to develop those relationships. Um, but the overlooked benefits, I feel like, are worthwhile to give it a second go if you've kind of given up on on-premise. Um, that low-cost point of entry encourages experimentation and trial, and it strengthens brand recognition. Um, the main thing that I would, I guess, caution or advise is that when you're talking to on-premise accounts, remember that service is paramount uh, in all of them. And they expect the same level of service that they deliver to their guests. So the bullet points here on the right, uh, just kind of briefly underscoring some of their importance. Uh, respect their time. When you do your homework and you know their list before you call on them, you can be aware of potential products that you offer that could supplement their list 
uh, essentially holes in their list. Um, focus on their needs. Don't pitch your wine. Go in there and ask questions. And going back to the first point, don't ask questions you should already know the answer to if you've done your homework. But by asking questions, you can help them get what they need. Um, be accessible. I can't tell you how many times we were out of a product uh, or the distributor was out of a product when I was a wine buyer and I would call other distributors and the first one that answered the phone got that got that sale for that week and maybe going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so jump balls go to the first person to answer the phone. Um, if you promise a, a case of wine to be delivered on Friday, make sure it is, even if it means that you're taking a drive. And next, don't run out of product. Um, there's an exclamation point next to that because it is pretty important. Uh, inventory is a tiny fraction at on-premise locations compared to retailers. Each of them, you know, the, an out-of-stock item in a restaurant is just like taking money out of their pockets. Additionally, reprinting 300 menus because you sold 20 cases of wine to a retailer and now you don't have enough of that product to last until the release of the next vintage. And that means that when that next vintage is released, it's not going back on the list there. Neither are any of your other wines ever. Um, so be aware that if you have an on-premise, uh, especially if it's by the glass, don't sell that wine in, in excess anywhere else. Make sure you know the depletions at that on-premise location and build a relationship that way. Follow up after the sale, you know, especially if it's a new account, make sure that they don't have any questions about your product or are curious about anything else. And then uh, the price is the price. Um, don't quote a price and then invoice for a different price. It's probably less common when you're self-distributing, but it happens way more frequently than you would ever believe is possible uh, with distributors. Um, and it's a great way to guarantee that your placement will be fleeting. And service after the sale, I just wanted to double down on that for a second. It's important, right? I feel like a lot of people are like, yes, I got in at this restaurant, done. And then they walk away. Go there for dinner, right? Tell your friends to go there for dinner and have your wine and ask for your wine. Go just get a glass of wine at the bar when you know it's a slow afternoon and get to know the bartender, get to know the people who are representing your wine in a casual way so that you can kind of help this. Like these are customer service professionals, right? Like they really relate to good customer service. And so if you can provide that, you're going to stand out. And especially because remember, you are competing against big booze. And Big Booze has a lot more resources than you do. So they have a whole team of people whose job is to do this kind of stuff and provide great customer service and make sure they're answering the phones and all of that. And so you have to make sure you level up your kind of service game in order to compete. And that's where the 80-20 rule comes back into play. If you're just fo focused uh, you know, on three or four on-premise accounts, it's a lot easier than trying to do two dozen. Um, you can only go out to dinner so many places. <laughs> service after the sale, another fun kind of anecdote. When I was a wine buyer, there was a rep that um, got a placement on our list and he wanted something by the glass, but his offerings were a little high end and couldn't swing that. And he would come in and sit at the bar probably once a week and order a bottle of his wine, pour himself a little glass and then wait for somebody else to come and sit down next to him. And he would start talking about his wine and pour it for them. He didn't talk the, about the fact that he was distributing it or that he represented it. He's just talking about how much he liked it. And frankly, I liked it a lot too. And he shared it with people and they liked it. And then they, they would sit down at their table and lo and behold, you know, a ticket would come through for a bottle of wine to go to that table. Um, yeah. You are you, the, your own best marketer for your brand, for sure. All right, our last myth here is that marketing comes after distribution. Travis, you are already ahead of the game here and I'm proud of you for that. Um, so the belief underlying this myth is that you need to have a product first, distribution second, and then you'll start marketing your brand. Because what's the point of marketing if there's nothing anyone can buy, right? Wrong. Marketing is a long game and it takes a while to move consumers and accounts through the ever important consumer journey. Building a brand and creating demand via marketing is something that should start before you even have something to sell. So imagine you're a buyer and a winemaker comes into your business telling you that they're brand new and full of excitement and information. What does this buyer hear? Nobody knows you. Uh, there's a huge risk here that despite perhaps loving your wine and your story, that your product will sit on their shelf collecting dust. Now, imagine you're a buyer and a winemaker comes in and tells you that they're new, and, but they have a local following of 2,000 people on social media, uh, 2,000 people on Instagram, yeah. 2,500 on Facebook, and a mailing list of 500 people, and they get four inquiries a week asking where 
consumers can buy their wine. <clears throat> As a buyer, this shows me that you are a savvy business owner who's doing the work and therefore is have higher probability of success. If you can share your marketing plan and show these accounts how it will help them and provide assets for them to use in tandem with your marketing efforts, all the better. And, you know, the second example is definitely someone I would prefer to partner with. So our successes can be shared. Absolutely. All right, so as you start gaining accounts, a great marketing tactic to focus on that is a win-win for you and your new account is suggesting a co-hosted maker feature. These can be winemaker dinners, tasting events, educational evenings, game nights, and more. I know many winemakers like to stay behind the scenes, but whether you like it or not, your winemaker is your best asset for drawing in and creating loyal fans. Now, on the other hand, I know some winemakers love to be kind of out in front of everyone, and those are the ones who are chasing these types of maker features down. But maker features can only be successful if they are highly targeted. Otherwise, they are a giant waste of time. So make sure, again, like we've been talking about this whole presentation, about how to make sure it's the best fit for your brand. Now also, when it comes to designing events, you wanna think about the big picture and focus on relationship building and a value. So this can mean even teaming up with other wineries to have an event that focuses on a particular wine style and lets the marketing power of all the brands involved bring consumers in. Win, win, win. And I know a lot of people are reticent to kind of partner with other brands because they wanna get the consumer, like don't think that way. Rising tides lifts all boats. Um, and it really, especially in the craft industry is true. Now, it's also important, as with any marketing tactic, um, to define your success criteria before the event itself. Are you hoping to sign up mailing list members, get people to join your wine club, or simply get people asking about where to buy and about your tasting room for a more qualitative measure of that night's success? Knowing what success looks like will help you prepare for it and more likely to achieve it with any maker features that you participate in. Some thoughts to leave you with here. Uh, keep in mind, it's important to research and be highly familiar with both federal and state Tidehouse laws. Um, it sounds like, you know, Dorothy, you've got a leg up on others, perhaps in this category. Um, so whether, whenever you're considering including any account in advertising, um, public advertising versus like a one-on-one -on -one email or email marketing, even if it's free, like a social media post, it's always considered a thing of value. Thing of value. Yeah, in many states. Uh, mentioning less than three retail outlets in a marketing is prohibited unless it's tied to ticket sales for an event. So simply saying, go buy my wine at XYZ store uh, is oftentimes illegal. Um, I mean, even the whole like, we just got a new account and now we're being carried at this store. Like, look it up for your state. It varies state by state, but it's very risky and people get big fines when they, they do it. Um, <clears throat> it's also important to have a little empathy for yourself here. We know this is a lot. Yeah. Um, but if you keep in mind that distribution is only one part of the marketing ecosystem and find marketing partners you trust that you can lean on uh, so that you're not tackling and thinking about all of this in a silo by yourself, it really helps. Remember, we have our free private craft makers marketing community uh, where you can chat with fellow winemakers and get real-time advice. Uh, it's just one of the many options available to you uh, or make friends with other local winemakers as we were kind of just discussing and talk about distribution and teaming up and marketing your wines uh, so that you can get wings and uh, you know, create and build support and loyalty in your communities. So just to remind ourselves again of these myths and the realities, I'm not going to walk through them one by one because I want to make sure we leave a little time at the end for questions, but these are the five myths. We hope that these myths are kind of banished from your brain and now you have embraced these new realities and are willing and excited to start learning what you need to learn and like, especially with the technology and tools and kind of modern marketing available to you to be one of the distributors who is living in this kind of new modern world of distribution. And in summary, um, when it comes to distribution, even if you are a distributor, your mantra should be, if it's going to be, it's up to me. You're responsible for building distribution. You're responsible for generating demand. You're responsible for learning and welcoming innovative tools to help drive distribution and sales more effectively and efficiently. And 
most importantly, perhaps, remember you and your team are the best people to market your brand. Make the most of the opportunity to self-distribute. That's really cool. Uh, or work with a distributor who aligns with your goals. Distribution in and of itself, though, is not valuable. Getting the consumer sales is what the end goal is. And we hope what we shared today will help you do just that. All right, thank you again, Iowa Wine Growers Association for hosting this. Um, there's a reminder of our upcoming webinars as well. We hope to see some of you there and how you can stay connected with us here at the Crafty Cast. But otherwise, let's open it up to questions. And we are happy to stay an extra few minutes if anyone else wants to. Um, but yeah, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Go ahead and unmute if you have questions. We have a smaller group, so it's fine to do that. Mm -hmm. One thing I found interesting was the um, targeting to your uh, like retailers on Facebook. I mean, no, most wineries know how to target to consumers, mm -hmm. uh, but I guess I never really thought that many would be targeting to retailers. Yeah, and it's it's true. A lot of people don't think of that. And it's actually something I learned from someone else in the industry who has like 30 plus years of distribution and sales kind of marketing expertise. And this is one of his biggest recommendations is that like put your marketing hat on and the way that you're marketing consumers think about how you can do all of those things with trade and it really can supercharge your results yeah much of his time was spent with a little company you may have heard of called constellation <laughs> um, yeah so they've they've figured it out and it is a, a you know an interesting paradigm shift um, but it's remarkable to see that like we were saying trade members are people too um yeah. and tweaking that, that messaging just a little bit uh, can be just as effective as talking directly to consumers. Any questions? I was gonna comment about the storytelling portion because we are in Iowa and a few, not everybody um, has like a small farm background, but I know a few of the wineries do. And I know that that's gonna be a heavy portion of my marketing getting started is telling that story. Like I have a small vineyard planted out there now um, but going forward, that's something that I think is a tool that a lot of us could utilize um, as far as connecting with customers. And Yeah, and it's hard to do for a lot of people. So I always joke that a lot of times, you know, whenever I'm, I'm working with clients or thinking about taking on potential clients or new students or whatever, you know, I go to their website, I go to their social media feeds, I kind of look at them. And I can't tell you how often the about us is either missing, which like blows my mind that there's no about us. Or it's like so direct and to the point. I'm passionate about wine. I decided to start a winery, <laughs> you know, and, and then I'll have a chat with them. And especially if we have a chat over a drink and as we're talking, I'll be asking some probing questions. And all of a sudden I get these little nuggets of like, yeah, I went on this trip to France when I was in college and it really, you know, seeing all those vineyards everywhere. And, and all of a sudden these little details come out and I'm just like, those are the parts of your story that is going to make people connect with you. Sure. But it, when it's yourself, you think your story that everyone else has a similar story and it's nothing special and it's no big deal. And you have a hard time pulling that out. So it often is really helpful. What we teach in our, our class on this, that's all about building your brand story. Um, what we teach in this class is like to really, A, you have a whole series of questions to ask yourself and then to have some conversations with other people right? And, and tell them some of your stories and ask them what they think is compelling. Um, and it really makes a big difference, but it, it, it can be hard to do. Sure. Any and, comments and questions? All right. Well, okay. we thank you for joining. Yeah. Yeah. We hope you, you learned something new today. Yeah, thank you so much for um, this great presentation, Suzanne and um, Evan. I, I think it was really helpful. Um, as a reminder, we'll it is being recorded, so we'll share that with you as soon as we have it. And there'll be a short survey um, as well. If you could take a few minutes to complete that, we would really appreciate it. So, If any questions do happen to pop up after we hop off here, um, please note that you can email either of us uh, simply at Evan at the Crafty Cask or Suzanne at the Crafty Cask. Yep, we are here.